So let me give a brief introduction uh, to uh, Helga. So I know that many of you have known Helga, so Helga is no stranger to us. But let me give you a brief uh, uh, bio of Helga. So Helga Nowotny is Professor Emerita of Science and Technology Studies at ETH Zurich and a founding member of the European Research Council. In 2007, she was elected uh, ERC Vice President and then from March 2010 until December 2013, uh, she was the President of the European Research Council. So currently she's uh, the Chair of the ERA Council Forum Austria and member of the Austrian Council and Vice President of the Council for the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings. Now she is also a visiting professor at NTU Singapore. Among other, Helga is a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and continue to serve on many international advisory boards in Austria and throughout Europe. So Helga has published more than 300 articles in scientific journals. Her latest book in German is Eigenzeit Revisited, Inside the Algorithm. Her previous books include The Cunning of Uncertainty that was featured by the Financial Times on the list of the best books 2015, Naked Genes, Reinventing the Human in the Molecular Age, with Giuseppe Testa, uh, published by MIT Press, Insightful Curiosity, Innovation in a Fragile Future, MIT Press 2008, and Cultures of Technology and the Quest of Innovations, uh, and so on, and many more. Okay? So, uh, we're very happy to have her class, so let's uh, hear. Uh, thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Can you hear me in the back without microphone? Is it okay? Yes. If not, you raise your hand and then I take the, uh, the microphone. I prefer to, to, to stand. So before taking you into life in the digital time machine, I want to say something about the topic of time, which, uh, as you just heard, uh, has been accompanying me in various incarnations, if I may say, throughout my scientific career. I started out with a book that I called Eigenzeit. Eigenzeit at, uh, is a German word, but it also was taken over by, by Einstein in physics. It has a very specific meaning in, in physics. And for me, it was a way of trying to answer the question, why uh, do people want to have time for themselves? And what is it in society, the kind of pressures people experience that uh, you know, generates this desire, I want to have time for myself. So this is how it started. Then I became um, aware that there is an international society for the study of time, which is very interdisciplinary as the topic of time is of interest to practically all disciplines. And the society managed to get uh, people together with one exception, Johannes, if I may say, only economists refused because, <laughs> because economists are thinking in terms of opportunity costs. <laughs> and so they were thinking, if I go to an interdisciplinary conference, you know, my work will not be that much appreciated than if I speak about time in an economic conference. So bracket closed, no insult <laughs> intended. <laughs> but just to give you a flavor, you know, interdisciplinarity ha carries its own, um, you know, structure and, and dynamics. And then um, once you start to, to, to think and work about time, it never lets you go completely. So I kept to be very much interested in the concept of the future. How is future imag imagined? How is future shaped, made, etc.? Uncertainty is part of the future. And now I ended up with the digital time machine. What is the digital time machine? It's the attempt I make to understand how does digitalization affect our experience of time. So I'm not speaking about what is time, the philosophical question that has not been solved uh, until now and will never be solved, what is time? But we can uh, think, we can analyze, we can do empirical studies also about how we experience time. And so this is behind my interest. 
And I find it always useful when I give a talk to make the audience understand what has the talk to do with the person and where does the person's interest in a topic come from. And those of you who are in the stage where you are looking for your research question, your research problem, be it for a master's, be it for a PhD, it's a very hard task. You know, where do these problems come from? How do I find one that is interesting and that fits with me? And sometimes it's useful just to do a little bit of introspection and think, you know, <clears throat> why am I interested or not interested in something? And uh, it, it may help you then to translate it into something that can become your research work. So much for an introduction. And <clears throat> the way how to, um, how to go about is I want to put the topic of the way how we experience time under digitalization into a much broader frame. So I'm, there are many studies that are being done, you know, what does it do to you if you wear a fitness band, uh, you have your data tracked, uh, etc. There are studies that look, empirical studies that look, for instance, if uh, a company moves to have a digitalized, synchronized agenda for the employees. You know, how do, how do they experience this, etc. So there are many empirical studies that are all valuable, but they bring little puzzles to a larger picture. And I cannot claim to have the larger picture, but at least I want to have a larger frame around what we are talking about. And this is why I start with unprecedented uh, global challenges, because um, the global challenges are there, which also means there is a spatial dimension in which we have to think what happens in our experience of time. It's the global dimension. And also um, the global challenges, if you take climate change as an example, it means uh, that we and we live in one of many time scales in the universe. We have to go back and we have to uh, interact with other time scales. If you want uh, to do, find out about climate change or any other global challenge, uh, researchers have to go back and, for instance, drill ice cores in the Antarctic because the ice core can tell researchers which isotopes were trapped at what age, way, way back, and what does the composition that you find in the ice core that you can then analyze in chemical ways and other ways tell you about the climate at that time. And so we are confronted with different time scales, and we have only one small band of time scale in which human life developed and in which we live. So this is... <clears throat> why I find it uh, useful to start with global, uh, unprecedented global challenges. Now, this is a summary that you probably are familiar with. The United Nations uh, have made a, a really impressive effort to come up with these 17 sustainable development goals. I'm not going in detail into them, but I just want to tell you that, uh, for instance, what is happening now in Europe in the research field is that uh, there are more and more efforts on the part of universities, on the part of research funders to point out, you know, this is the background. And we want to mobilize more research that is directed to one or several, I mean, they're all interconnected in some way, one or more of these uh, development goals. So this is also important from the research perspective, if you want to, from an STS uh, perspective, that uh, these are some of the most important research topics that we will face in the future, and how to go about it. And again, it must be an interdisciplinary effort. And economists are essential in that part. You cannot uh, tackle any one of them without having economists uh, uh, on board. So this is 
one way of uh, bringing in these unprecedented um, uh, challenges. But of course, uh, living in a social and in a political world, we also face challenges and worrying uh, sides of this kind. The elites versus the people, protesters on the street from Chile to Hong Kong to Catalonia to Iraq, etc. Every day almost you find new pictures of this kind. And <clears throat> some people say, well, uh, this is correlated with, we see growing inequalities um, everywhere. Branko Milanovic, one of the um, persons who has been at the forefront of working about global inequalities. Um, so this is something that we also have to take uh, into, into account. And <clears throat> then what are the solutions that appear here? Where are we going? What can we possibly do? And so this is again a topic that comes up again and again, you know, the Green Deal. We need green technologies. And some people say, well, you know, capitalism has to be abolished. Others say capitalism has to be reformed. Others want another capitalism. So it's very much tied with the economic system that, that we have. But the time dimension comes in because even if everyone agrees we need and we want green technologies, the question is how fast, how fast can we get there? We know we are in a tr transition period. We have to get rid of uh, relying as much as we now do on fossil fuels. We need to move towards alternative green technologies. But how fast can it be done? What needs to be done to make it faster, et cetera? So again, you have a time dimension uh, in this. Now, time, <clears throat> as you um, are aware, uh, it has to be thought also together with, with space. This is not just Einstein's relativity theory, but it's always good to, to think of time and space uh, t together. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if you go back in history, uh, also the role of technologies that uh, comes, uh, comes in here, as, as you will see in a moment. The, um, if you go back in history, people's uh, conceptions of time were very much uh, in tune or they were trying to be in tune with the natural environment. They saw the sunrise, they saw the moonrise, and of course they had <clears throat> technologies, primitive technologies, but they became ever more sophisticated to be able to coordinate the social life <clears throat> of the tribe, of the society, with what they saw, the correspondence going on in the cosmic um, uh, events. And then <clears throat> in agricultural societies, uh, again, you had a very uh, strong synchronization with the natural environment around it, when to get up, when to go to bed, the animals, uh, etc., uh, until industrialization changed rather drastically the concept of time regulated now by the clock and having a linear time uh, concept. While in many previous societies, there was circular concepts of time. And with industrialization and modernity, it became this linearity. And <clears throat> I would say now we no longer see this linearity as we did in, in, under modernity. Rather, we see a multiplicity of times. We see many different time scales and different modes in which time is experienced, measured, um, etc. And space, <clears throat> and what I call the discovery of spatial finiteness, comes in, and I want to illustrate this with an article <clears throat> that was published by John von Neumann in, in 1955. Who knows uh, in the room John von Neumann? So many don't know him. So he was what one calls a polymath. Uh, he was an extremely talented, gifted person born in Hungary, then moved to the, to the US. And he was working in the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton during the, uh, the Second World War. And he was one of the first people working on a computer that actually was 
functioning. There were many attempts, but he managed with, with his team. And then this man writes an article with the title, Can We Survive Technology? So, you know, you wonder he is one of the foremost uh, protagonists of uh, technology. Um, and then he asks this question, can we survive it? So what was meant was the technology of his day, namely nuclear weapons. And he became very much worried about nuclear weapons. You cannot read it, and therefore I will show you what is written here above. So <clears throat> he wondered, and he said, for the kind of explosiveness that man will be able to contrive by 1980, the globe is dangerously small. Its political units dangerously unstable. And I think, you know, in a nutshell, he captures the idea we have somehow reached the finiteness of our globe. Today, we also think of finiteness of the globe in terms of um, we are exhausting the natural resources. We are discovering this is the only habitat we have. You know, some people dream of going into outer space, but this may take a long, long time if it ever happens. Uh, so, and, and he says, with these weapons, which are, you know, the highest technical achievement of humankind and the most dangerous, of course, um, the, the Earth has become too small given the instability of our political unit. And I think this is a very uh, deep insight that he has here. And mm, this raises, mm, this raises uh, of course, other questions. One question uh, that also comes to mind is, here is someone who was at the very forefront of the technological development of computers. So when we speak today about digitalization, it's computers, it's big data, it's the, the, the computational power of uh, big data and, and clever algorithm. So here was the man who was doing this at the very forefront, and yet when he thought about um, you know, technology, he did not speak about computers, he did not even think what kind of societal impact uh, it could have. He was thinking about the destructive potential wiping out uh, life, life on Earth. And so other questions <clears throat> are, you know, have we peaked? Peak oil has, uh, has shown, uh, this is a very old story, I won't get into it, but peak oil, you know, has been pronounced many, many times and uh, it has never actually happened. People find new oil fields, it becomes more expensive, finding them, uh, exploiting them, because uh, the technology has to be much more refined. But at least for oil, we cannot say it has peaked as a resource. But we may have peaked the use of oil if we want to have a more sustainable environment. So these are again, you know, the temporal dimensions that I want to alert you. When we speak about a peak, what does it actually mean? And um, there are therefore different interpretations that, that you can give. And then something obvious, but you know, putting our faith in technology is, is good, but we should always remind uh, ourselves technology alone without um, the, the social ways of implementing it, creating conditions under which it can be appropriated, etc., will not uh, save us. So this brings us to the Anthropocene. <clears throat> the Anthropocene is a concept that was first launched by Paul Crutzen, a Nobel uh, Prize laureate in, in chemistry. And he was giving um, a talk and he, he sort of um, casually, meant more or less casually, mentioned, um, well, you know, we have actually, humans have arrived at a point in the evolution of life, the evolution of humanity, where we have got the capability of changing the earth. And Anthropocene means the age of humans. 
And uh, <clears throat> now this concept was very appealing <coughs> to, to, to many people, and so it became used. But then there is one group of uh, scientists who are actually the gatekeepers of what you can call and how you can classify the ages of the Earth, and these are the geologists. You may have remembered or forgotten in school, you, at one point you were taught the ages of the Earth. Uh, very difficult to remember, I, I, I agree. And then there are the subdivisions of the ages, and you have epochs, etc., etc. You may remember the Cambrian uh, age, etc. So, and now the Anthropocene. So, what do the geologists do? They are the official gatekeepers of the age of the Earth. They are in charge of classifying, determining, um, and how do they do it? Well, geology has to do with the earth, with the stones, with the rocks, everything that we, we stand upon. And <clears throat> an age uh, can only be defined according to certain criteria that have been the same for using, if you want to have a classification, you have to use the same uh, criteria, of course. And now <clears throat> there's an international union of geological sciences. They have set up a working group uh, the working group has been, uh, you know, discussing and looking for what is called uh, in the geological jargon, it's called a golden spike. And it means they have to find in the rocks, in the strata, or in sediments of a lake, they have to find evidence, hard evidence, that uh, something that has been produced by humans has actually changed the composition of the rock or the way how the lake functions, uh, etc., etc. And now they're looking for it. There are different alternative solutions that have been provided, but the most likely, and this brings me back to the atomic bomb, the most likely are the radioactive traces that can still be found in the sediments where the first nuclear tests were carried out. And this will probably be the official beginning of humans changing the Earth and the official beginning of the Anthropocene. Now, the Anthropocene is not only about the beginning, it's actually, and that's the more important point, it's about the age we live in. And <clears throat> the, the concept has um, acquired, you know, concepts are proposed by someone, they can be used by scientists for certain purposes, but they can also be taken up by society. And this is what has happened with the concept of Anthropocene. It has been widely taken up as a concept that reminds us, you know, we did it, so there is some kind of responsibility that comes with it, and we better find a way to get to, to manage what we have done wrong if we have, uh, you know, uh, pushed the natural resource services provided to humans to the brink. So what are we going to do? So it carries this notion of some kind of responsibility, but also a notion of urgency. You know, do something now. What can be done? And here, <clears throat> another geological view this is the deeper core of the Earth. <clears throat> and what you see on the crust here is an unfamiliar view of our planet. You can see Southeast Asia down here, this little bump. And you, see, you can see um, Africa there. So this is just another way of visualizing how thin and that's the, uh, the intention with showing this image, how thin the crust is on which uh, we live. Normally we see the globe with, you know, solid continents. Well, they are solid up to a point if you look, you know, what is happening uh, below. And <clears throat> I <clears throat> take this to mean also what humans have been doing. After all, we are also biological beings we do what many uh, living organisms have been doing before us. And uh, 
organisms do still living with us. They crave a niche out of the environment. So another way of looking at it is what humans have been doing, even if we are positioned only at this tiny, tiny crust, you know, we have been starting to have our, our niche. Uh, cutting down forests uh, to, to have space for agriculture, etc., etc., and then becoming ever more sophisticated in building our niche. In the time of industrialization, you were producing mass material, but you were already transforming it. You took stones, you were transforming them to have buildings. You were producing iron uh, for bridges, uh, railroads, etc. So this is part of you know, taking out raw material from the environment, transforming it with ever more sophisticated technologies and the scientific knowledge that goes with it to build our niche. And I think we have now arrived at the point in time where we are building a digital niche. We are using sensors, we are using digital tools, uh, we are just at the beginning of doing it and we don't have as yet a clear um, idea of what we are actually doing, but I think we are uh, building a, a digital niche. Now, <clears throat> being <clears throat> in a <clears throat> in, in, at this moment in, in time <clears throat> where we have arrived at a new... Um, age in looking at the age of the earth, but also in terms of our scientific technological development, we have arrived in what you can call the age of digitalization, of AI, uh, wh whatever you call it. And <clears throat> this, uh, again, uh, you know, has a, an impact on our temporal uh, experience. And um, here, um, I want to focus, um, as, as I said, there are many empirical studies, you know, looking on the micro level as how do people interact with the digital devices. And I'm interested, what does digitalization mean for our conception? What is the past? What is the present? What is the future? Now, these are categories that you find in every society but the meaning attributed to these categories varies according to the historical period and also it varies how you look at them. In many societies previously, the past was considered set. It is a golden age that will not return or you may return after I don't know how many cycles uh, in the further evolution. So you have these different ideas, conceptions, imaginary images of what the past is. The present can be shorter or longer. It can be um, you know, derived from the past in a more stricter way, in a less stricter way, etc. And then there is the future. And what happens throughout <clears throat> human history in most parts of the world is that roughly before 1750, in most places, people were convinced the future has already been determined by the past. Be it fate, the gods, God, whatever force at work, but the past had set already what would happen, or God's higher powers would know what would happen. So it was already there, only the humans did not know about it. We were ignorant, but it had been set. And then, of course, you have all these stories of people trying to escape what has already been preset. So you have religious rituals, uh, etc., to try to, you know, get a tiny uh, way out of it. And there are many legends and, and stories about this. So, but what happened in around the middle of the 18th century? Uh, and, and it started uh, first in, in Europe, was the idea that perhaps the future has not been set by the past. Perhaps the future is open. And this has been accepted as being uh, the hallmark of what we call modernity. We have an open future. 
we have something in front of us. Uh, <clears throat> you know, also evolution is open, which came later. The uh, which with with Darwinian um, evolutionary perspectives came a bit later, but it was a revolutionary, radical idea of an open future. And this is no coincidence that it happened at that time. This was the time of the Enlightenment thinkers. It was a time of you know, also social changes, transformation, aristocracy, you know, having to make room for <clears throat> professional middle classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are always social and political conditions around these ideas that come up. But it also meant somehow we can, we can shape the future. Maybe not very much, uh, maybe, um, you know, we have to learn how to do it, but we can shape the future. And this is still, you know, the main idea that is driving our societies everywhere today. Uh, without the open future, science and technology would not be possible. And science and technology are at the very forefront of this open future because um, <clears throat> we know that science has come up with phenomena that do not exist in nature. Nobody knew they did not exist, comes up with new products, uh, new phenomena, etc. So, you know, everything seems possible, but the question, of course, is where is human agency? What can we actually do? Um, we have constantly to try to, you know, enlarge in what we can do, how much, but then, of course, we also realize how little we can foresee the future. We can foresee certain things, but then comes this complexity of interactions, of consequences that we are not really, we are blind towards them, and this is why we speak about the unintended consequences of human action. And this is where we are grappling uh, with the complexity that we now have. So <clears throat> what has uh, happened, and going back now to when I say, you know, the, <clears throat> the shifting of our temporal bearings, the shifting between what do we look at past, what do we look at and experience as, as present and as future, we get to something that I call we cannot escape the present. And what I mean by this is that uh, we feel very much living in the present, but we feel, how do, how do we feel it? We feel an enormous time pressure that we are under. And if you go back to read the literature of previous times, I mean, you are surprised how much time people had. They were bored, they did not know what to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, none of them felt this pressure of, of time. And therefore, we want to do everything within 24 hours. <clears throat> we pile up more and more activities that we want to be engaged in. And this, of course, accelerates this feeling of time compression, density. Um, acceleration is even not that important. I, I think this feeling of of density and compression is, is more important. But of course, you have also acceleration in, in, in many dimensions. And um, is, uh, I, I think we are blurring the boundaries, separating our present from the past and from the future. And this is what I would like to show you with, with the past. We now have these possibilities. And again, this is science and technology. We have fantastic ways of getting um, to know what happened one billion three hundred million years ago somewhere in the vast universe. The LIGO detector that uh, was a project that went on for 50 years and received the Nobel Prize a few years ago was able to detect tiny waves that came from a black hole, again, somewhere out, way, way out in, in the universe. And of course, we have, uh, you know, the fossil um, records that already geologists uh, early on and, and Darwin uh, for his theory of evolution used very much. So what happened in the past 
um, bringing the past in. And of course, with DNA, we are now, with paleogenomics, uh, we are able to trace migratory um, strands practically around the world. Every week, we get a new finding by the paleogenesists uh, 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 of finding a new piece of a bone of a Neanderthal and a Denisovan, etc., etc. And this past is coming into our present. And we are not looking at it as something that happened. We know cognitively, of course, this happened a long time ago. But it comes into our present, and we experience it as though it were happening now. You know, you read the newspaper, and you know the difference. Did it happen uh, two weeks ago, or did it happen one million years ago? Becomes smaller and smaller, and and blurred. If we turn towards human history, of course, this has always played a, a big role. Um, <clears throat> our interaction with human, the human past. And as every historian, are there historians in the room? No. One. Hello. <laughs> historians have always insisted, uh, you know, we ask different questions of the past. Every generation of historians or also historians in different cultures, in different parts of the world, ask different kind of questions of the past. You have this rich record of events, of sources, that uh, what, whatever they are, <clears throat> and they tell you something, but it is the questions you ask. And now <clears throat> we, and this is one example that uh, comes in with digital means, we are able to ask new questions. And I just want to show you one example. And let me emphasize, this is, I want to show this to you, not because I think now all historians have to move into quantified history. This is not the case. I want to show it to you that using, and we were talking about it the other day, using a different method allows you to ask also different questions. And so it's not about a hierarchy of methods, and now don't all move into uh, quantified history, but realize you can ask it. So what is this? This is based on a huge database. <clears throat> and a group of archaeologists, um, <clears throat> digital um, uh, working in, in complexity science and, and other people, have assembled a huge database. Uh, without data, you cannot do anything. Uh, it's obvious. And <clears throat> they came up with um, a classification of <clears throat> degrees of complexity that uh, societies reached at various um, points in time. And for instance, in this study, <clears throat> they say the society with the highest social complexity was, if I pronounce it rightly, the Qing, the, the Qing dynasty in China around 1900 AD. And the least in their sample is early woodland in Illinois around 400 BC. And from these examples alone, you see, you know, they look all over the world to find data on societies. Now, the new question they asked was, um, can we ask our data, our historical data, about complex societies, when did uh, they call it moralizing gods uh, arise. And by moralizing gods, they mean <clears throat> the deity that was revered in these societies, and the deity was either rewarding or punishing certain kinds of behavior. That's what a moralizing god does and why and how a moralizing god functions. And they, <clears throat> before, there were many uh, historians grappling with the question, and some said, no, it had to rise before, and complexity followed after, and others were of different opinion. So they were able, uh, they claim at least, and you know, uh, from, from the data, it's, it's very evident, they say um, that the, <clears throat> the complex societies precede the moralizing gods. And uh, this not only in one part of uh, world history, 
but in all these places that uh, that you see here. Now, <clears throat> just as a, as a footnote, um, they also say, well, in uh, the in the societies preceding the moralizing gods, um, what uh, they were all practicing were rituals, different kinds of rituals, and the the function of the rituals was to establish uh, communities, <coughs> the binding of people and establishing communal ties through the rituals. But it has nothing to do with reward and punishment by one, um, you know, authority that was considered to be um, a, a moralizing god. So <clears throat> this is our interaction with, with the past. But if we uh, ask ourselves, what else is happening in the present? Well, <clears throat> the future is already here. As the science fiction writer Gibson said long, long time ago, it's unevenly distributed. And we see it all around us. Uh, it is unevenly distributed because you have different um, degrees of development, uh, etc. Uh, but you f also feel this, the future is here. You, you, you can see it. It has arrived, but it is not everywhere. It has not spread uh, everywhere. And <clears throat> just to show you that uh, this is not only me inventing such a title, but this uh, I found was also the title by uh, a group of scientific advisors that were advising the <clears throat> United Nations and they gave it this title, the, the future is now. So we feel in the present, not only this time pressure to fit everything that we want to do within our short 24 hours day that we cannot extend because we are biological beings. And yet, you know, we feel also the future uh, wanting us to participate in future making, shaping the future, and um, incorporating the future in what we do. And this leads to the kind of temporal complexity of, of the present we have. Now, <clears throat> let me <clears throat> move on to something that is um, perhaps a bit more specific, where I see um, <clears throat> another kind of relation between the present and the future, and this is uh, predictive analytics, the predictive power of algorithms. Let me just all remind you, when I speak about digitalization, how did it come about? You know, computers, you heard already, John von Neumann, he was already working in the 40s on computers. Algorithms have been with mathematicians since <coughs> mathematics was invented. Um, so what is it, data we had, uh, statistical data from the 17th century onward. So what brought it about? And it is the convergence of big data, which go far beyond what statisticians did in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, where they collected whatever they could collect. Uh, so we have big data, uh, of course, collected with digital means. We have uh, unprecedented computer power. Without that, we would not be able to do very much. And we have clever algorithms. And part of the cleverness of the algorithms through machine learning, deep learning, neural uh, network-based uh, algorithms, they are able to be given data to uh, work with these data, process these data. Nobody knows quite how it works, but they are able to predict what will happen in the future. And <clears throat> so this is a very powerful tool that we have now. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it connects the present with the future again in a new way. And this is where I come to the digital time machine. Now, <clears throat> Wanting to know the future is not new. Some of you may have seen these pictures uh, before. Uh, Chinese oracle bones going way, way back uh, as a way of divination, uh, taking the shoulder blades of uh, turtles or, or, or sheep, 
holding them above fire and uh, you needed a special, uh, you know, also te technologies everywhere, uh, special tools. And then you had to interpret the cracks. And now people um, who have worked on this think that these were actually the origins of Chinese writing. So the, the way how to, that, that it comes from making marks as a practice of, of divination. Now, we no longer do divination, but we still write all these reports that tell us, you know, Singapore 2050 or 40 or wherever we are. So we want to know what is coming in the future. It's a very deep-seated uh, wish we have. And so <clears throat> we get the kind of digital time machine <clears throat> that I want you to, to reflect on. Um, based on this ability by algorithms to predict what will come next. Now, there are many different fields of applications. You know, predict what? You know the kind of uh, advertisements or appeals you get from Google or Amazon. You have bought this the last uh, time. Now we offer you that because we know <coughs> your preferences. Uh, you will like it because we know what you did in the past. So you're all familiar with this kind of simple or trivial prediction. But nevertheless, you know, it has a huge impact on the business of Amazon. It has a huge impact also the way how we go about as consumers because we, we somehow rely on it creatures of habit, so if we are told this is what you are going to like in the future, you, you go on with this. But there are many different applications. So one field, and I don't have to go time uh, to, to go into it, but one field that I find fascinating is weather prediction. And the enormous uh, progress has been made. Also, uh, partly, of course, again, because now we have drones, we have sensors that people before did not have. Uh, weather prediction was started in Norway uh, way back with uh, the first flying machines. The weather uh, in Norway is extremely difficult to predict because it changes all, all the time. And uh, a researcher by the name of Bjarkes, Bjarkes he was staged, uh, he lived in Bergen, and he was one of the first to start it uh, with the mathematics of weather prediction. And now we have a huge um, <clears throat> you know, research enterprise, and it is still largely in the hands of governments but there are now tendencies to privatize also part of the weather prediction uh, because governments feel they can no longer afford it. And I, I think it would be a pity if it were to happen. Uh, and now you are able to track uh, storms live. So you can actually see on the screen where is the storm, what is doing, etc. Here at the NTU, you have an Earth observatory where you can also observe live some of these things that, that are happening. But it's not only the weather. Algorithms, maybe you are more interested in success than in, in the weather. Um, this is uh, the book to reach then. This is Barabashi, who is a network um, analyst, uh, well known. And he wrote this book, um, The Formula to Success. And again, you know, it's based on looking at a lot of data, um, <clears throat> what happened to, how did people become successful? And um, <clears throat> so you can discuss, you know, what his, his definition of success, and uh, it's not the same as achievement. So you, it's, it's a social attribution. You are successful if the world around you claps and says, you have done well. And there are many others who achieve something and nobody claps. And yet, you know, <laughs> this is the other side of it. Uh, but, uh, and then <clears throat> uh, economists also jumped uh, on it. These are three uh, economists who wrote this um, book, The Simple Economics of AI. They keep repeating it. It's a simple economics of AI. And now we have the prediction machine. So what does the prediction machine do? Uh, it's a rather simple definition of prediction that they use. <clears throat> they say it's the process of filling in missing information. 
can be anything missing information. Prediction takes information you have, data, and uses it to generate information you don't have. Very simple formula. And you can make money with this. And uh, <clears throat> so here you have the way how you make money because the costs of prediction, having so many data, they say the costs will sink, obviously, if you have a lot of supply, and the costs uh, go down. The experts will be replaced, and the experts are expensive. So it's good for your business if you, ex uh, if you, if you throw out the experts and you replace them in your business with, uh, with this uh, prediction machine, with AI. Your productivity, of course, goes up and uh, they speak about the semi-automation of, of, the, of the value chain. Now, <clears throat> this is, you know, economists probably will take some issue with this. Uh, this is not my, my, my purpose here. just want to say, to show you how many applications there are. And now I want to show you another <clears throat> uh, field of application of this predictive <coughs> power of algorithm, namely, <clears throat> the next Rembrandt. And this is interesting insofar as when we speak about digitalization, about machines, we always think, well, you know, where are the limits? And there are all these science fiction uh, stories about singularity. I don't believe in singularity, I admit. But, uh, you know, when are we reaching the limit when the machines can do better than humans, not only where it's obvious they are faster, we will never reach them, but what makes us human creativity, human creativity, our uniqueness. And so <clears throat> this next Rembrandt was an, um, <clears throat> it's, it's based on, on the work by Alison uh, Langmidt here, and she's very critical about it. She says, a case study in research as computer magic. So what, did, what does the computer magic look like? This was a um, highly advertised event <clears throat> staged in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum, which is the, mu the museum for Rembrandt. <clears throat> and um, it was his hometown also, so they have a beautiful collection of, of, of Rembrandt. And so they very openly say the next Rembrandt is one of this year's most talked about artificial intelligence meets creativity projects. A group of art historians, material researchers, data scientists, and engineers led by Walter Thompson, Amsterdam, for the client ING and technical partner Microsoft, spent 18 months, so it's not something minor, 18 months to take on a controversial challenge. And now it comes, how to teach a machine to think, act, and paint like a Rembrandt. That's the advertisement. Now, what did they actually do? Here you see, <clears throat> this is not a complete collection of portraits that Rembrandt made. Now, you have to take out some, you know, you cannot use everyone. So they took out some of these uh, collections, but uh, st somewhat strangely, they also took out uh, faces from here. Now, you may have seen this or not. It's, a, it's a fa another famous Rembrandt and, and seen at an anatomy theater. And, you know, you may wonder, is a portrait when you sit still because, you know, you have a famous painter painting you for your family so that you can hang it up at home, or whether you are you know, curious to see what, does, what is happening here when the corpse is open. I would say the facial expressions are bound to differ, but never mind. They took also these. <clears throat> and, you know, the technical uh, details are really fantastic. I mean, 18 months spent by these people, uh, they did very sophisticated work in how <clears throat> to measure and uh, to get the AI working on many of these parameters. And uh, <clears throat> this is just a detail of all, you know, this is, is the painting in one part. So it's, it's very, very detailed. So now you're curious to see what the next Rembrandt looks like. This is it. 
So this was unveiled in a big ceremony, the next Rembrandt. And now I ask you, what is the next Rembrandt? You know, is it, as they said, we teach the AI to think, act, and paint like Rembrandt? Or is it averaging the many portraits he did, putting them together? I mean, also in averaging, putting together, you need some creative uh, ideas. So this is, you know, food for thought. <clears throat> it shows that what the ad promises and the actual outcome is rarely identical. But it also means, you know, be critical when you read an ad and think what is behind it without demeaning the, the technical capabilities and really fantastic work uh, they did. Uh, but also what it means <clears throat> when people in the museum, I don't know what happened to the, to the picture actually, um, <clears throat> whether they left it there or whether they put it somewhere else, when um, <clears throat> you know, people are shown this is the next Rembrandt, how would you react when you see now this is the next Rembrandt? Does it convince you that the AI can predict what Rembrandt or Leonardo da Vinci or whoever would have painted? Or are we... So it's also a question, how far can you predict? And even if you have the most sophisticated AI, you know, how far, and this depends on the field of application, of course, but how far uh, in, into the future can you see? So this brings me to the end and, and to questions I call it <clears throat> towards the governance of complexity because I think this is really what uh, we will have to deal with in the future. But um, these are some of the issues um, I, I think we need to reflect upon, um, discuss. Now, <clears throat> the power of prediction is it's, it's there. We, we recognize it, we see it, we use it. Um, even if we don't follow all the recommendations that we get or um, if the uh, simple economics of AI is not really the key to the next business model, but we use it. Uh, it becomes part of uh, the way how we function. But um, the more we rely on it as being a powerful new tool that lets us see ahead, what does it do to us? And we know sociologists way back in the early 30s of last century were speaking about self-fulfilling prophecies and describing the phenomena. So if you uh, are told, if you believe that something will happen, then you adjust your behavior, your mental attitudes accordingly, and it actually can happen. And uh, in many other fields, we know herd behavior on markets, financial markets, herd behavior is a common uh, trait because everyone else does it, because they believe the predictive um, algorithm, which is very widespread in financial services. It's an, you have here very good people working on automated financial services. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place. <clears throat> so, but where, you know, have, do we have to ask ourselves, um, is it true? Is it real? Is it an illusion? Where do we have to say, wait a moment? And uh, of course, there can be false prophets, there can be fake prophecies. Who would have thought when the internet came uh, to be wide, widely uh, available? that we would have an internet now full of fake news and of hate speech. Nobody had predicted it. It was seen as a liberating new way of um, you know, doing things with this wonderful technological tool in a different way. And it would really be uh, very bad if uh, predictive algorithms were caught by the same kind of, <clears throat> you know, a falsification and, and, and fakeness that happens. But the real question in my view is, what does it do to our view of the future? And when I mentioned that this was one of the greatest inventions of humanity, 
to see the future is open. Once you are surrounded by predictions, by machines that tell you, you know, we know what you will do, we know what diseases or what risks you will have, um, uh, we know how you, you, your business will work, we know whom to hire at the university, because the algorithm is capable of telling it better than the recruitment committee. You know, you give all the data to the algorithm, the algorithm comes up with it. So how far do we want to go? And where does um, we fall back into some kind of deterministic worldview? You know, remember when I said for the largest time of humanity, people were convinced the future has already been determined. You know, do we really want now, at this stage that we have reached in a scientific technological civilization, do we want to fall back now into a deterministic worldview? So this is the question I want to leave you with. Uh, some ideas how we might get it right. You know, we have to, uh, of course, always question where do our data come from, which data we use, etc. Um, we make, in my view, far too little use of simulation models that allow you to look ahead, but always under the condition what if, and you know the assumptions. Um, we should make simulation models much more inclusive and interactive in order to move there. So <clears throat> my last question is really, who would like to live in a completely predictable world or not? So thank you. <clears throat>
experimentalist, so you had a, <clears throat> to set up, you wanted to find out something, how does nature really work. They no longer believed in ghosts. Some may have believed in ghosts because we know, you know, the, uh, the blurring what was there. But at the very beginning, you know, they were really um, obsessed by the fear you know, we may fall into a trap of appearances. And this is how modern science started out. And now we don't uh, think about appearances anymore and not about ghosts, but we know whatever we look at, and this should be part of your research methodologies and to remind every researcher all the time, take nothing for granted. Look at what is the source of your data who has collected them? And I mean, then there are some interesting examples like the one you pointed out, you know. There are always assumptions of the time that are different from the assumptions we now have. And this is, you know, a more sophisticated way of interrogating uh, the data. But you always have to do it. And this is true regardless of the kind of, of research you do. It pertains to data pertains to, to samples when the first, uh, because I mentioned the, the paleogenomics uh, field, you know, one of the difficulties was contamination. You know, these were tiny, tiny little bone fragments that they found in caves. And um, although, <clears throat> you know, they tried to handle them carefully, etc. Uh, for, for, for 10 years, they made no progress because they discovered they, these tiny bones are contaminated with a DNA um, that comes from human or from animals or from plants uh, around there. So, you know, this is part of the scientific way of working. And I would like all of you, you know, to be reminded every day that this is what you are to do. Thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, I have Question number one is, what is your view? Is the future really set by the past or often at the future? Question number two, <coughs> given the powers of the digital machine, should we, especially people who are dealing with analytical science, forget about analytical solutions? Why bother the burden with the poor student learning all the nice integral? Forget about it. Just everything I go for simulation. Should we go for that? Number three, are academic actually the worst culprit because peer review, as well as asking the students eh, or any researchers, go to literature research and review it. So you get trapped, and as a result of which your paradigm shift is having real problem. You get caught by all this, and when you want to publish something, something that is no one else has done it, chances is most reviewer will say, "Sorry, I think I better put a lot of question mark on that." So I want to hear your view on all this. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. The answer to your first question, do I believe in an open future? Yes, yes, yes. I think um, I, made it, I made it clear, you know, science and technology, we, we should stop working today and kill ourselves, so I don't know what. If you don't believe in an open future, you have, you're in the wrong place if you work in science. And I think also as a human being. But, <clears throat> so, your second question about... Um, you know, how to use these analytic tools. Uh, there was a time in mathematics when, and in schools also, when you no longer use the slide rule. Yes? yes? <laughs> and so, you know, especially in mathematics, you can see, and you can, I'm not a historian of mathematics, but there were several very clear episodes where it became clear, you know, the new mechanical device that was based, of course, on calculations, so the analytics were all there, but now we could jump one step, and it was adopted. And I think something similar will happen, also in science. 
The question is, you know, what and where, and where does it make sense, and where does it not make sense? I give you one example. Recently, <clears throat> an article was published in a scientific journal <clears throat> where the author was not a person but an AI. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, there were people working behind the AI who were the authors of the AI, if you want, but only co-authors of the AI. And the <clears throat> article was scanning, I don't know how many thousands uh, of, uh, uh, of papers published in chemistry to look for a particular feature in the literature. Very useful, etc. Now, the article gave useful information because to have this kind of huge survey would have taken very long, such that the AI was doing it very quickly. Uh, it, some, the, the, there was a little note attached to the article and saying, well, the reading may at some times be somewhat um, unusual, you know, the writing, but, you know, it's not uh, high poetry or high literature that uh, this article pretends to be. So there are these instances where we will use the AI to very great benefit in science. But you have to know where and why. And this brings me to your question about peer review and AI. There's another recent paper <clears throat> that was published um, looking at the, um, all articles published since the 1920s, I think, in Physical Review Letters, which is one of the top uh, publications in, in physics. So going back really in, in history, where physics changed dramatically. And the <clears throat> authors wanted to find out um, what happened to what they call mainstream articles, what happens, to what they called uh, outliers, and what happens to interdisciplinary articles. So they had these three categories. And the assumption was, you know, mainstream is mainstream. The outliers are like the ones, you know, nobody believes you, but nevertheless, these got published. <clears throat> but they were outliers, so they had very, very few citations immediately afterwards. And they looked at what were the citations and what happened over time. Yeah? So it's not just now, but what happened over time. So they found out, and this is not surprising, the mainstream articles were quoted, of course, Mainstream, uh, you know, produces more mainstream. This is how it works. And the outliers <clears throat> had very few uh, citations, but then later on were picked up as something that was of interest, and they were the ones that survived over time. And the interdisciplinary were somewhere in between because it depended, you know, on, in which field it was taken up, etc. So, you know, it's an AI that allows us to ask these questions and to get answers. So I would say we know there are many things wrong with the with the peer review, but uh, and and we should admit this and we have to work on it and uh, I've said this here before I think uh, publication rates should be cut by 50% until 2030 it would be my radical uh, solution because we produce too much <clears throat> and um, we also see now you know th there is a shift uh, towards open science so you know only this um, Obsession with high impact journal is somewhat eroded. So there are interesting changes that, that, that go on. But, um, you know, this kind of result you would not get, or you, you would get it if you have a PhD student working for 10 years or, or something <laughs> on this. Yeah? So you can, you can do it. And it allows you, so this article, you know, generates new questions. And I want to really entice you to ask new kinds of questions with these uh, new tools also. Any other for you? Okay. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. So I have two questions for you. So one is that, um, so uh, whether, uh, what's your view whether the simulation models um, that's been used um, in financial markets or to predict um, 
um, this uh, the, the social behaviors, whether is it accurate to actually uh, predict human behaviors? Because for to to predict human behaviors, uh, uh, because um, from what um, I understand, uh, these simulation models they are written um, based on algorithms, and then we know that unless humans um, unless it's used to predict um, logical human thinking. Um, it, it will probably be accurate, but however, human beings often the time uh, engage uh, in heuristics. So, where the simulation models, if they are solely based on algorithms, whether they can be a representative of um, to predict for human behaviors. So, my second question is that um, even if algorithms are very um, accurate in the in the predictions, I was thinking that um, whether um, the data we collect um, currently is able to give a very accurate um, algorithm uh, for machine learning because like for example in, um, in experimental settings we can use algorithms for machine learning because um, in an experimentally contrived um, setting we fix um, the variables that you want to measure and we control for the rest of the things so feeding it with algorithms may give a very accurate pred uh, predictions but however this kind of prediction is based on the data that we feed in. So, if, if for example, um, if, if we use the data that we collect for, for example, for the financial markets um, before 2008, so uh, maybe from one, uh, maybe from 2000 to 2008, we may not be able to accurately predict the financial crisis in 2008 um, by itself because it's, it's contrived by the data that we collect. So hence, how, how we know how much data we should collect in order to give a very accurate predictions or it's an ongoing process. Yeah, I, th I, I think you are touching also on the question of, you know, what is the risk in doing risk modeling in, um, in, in, in a sense. And <clears throat> um, <clears throat> of course, you, you, you are right. Um, the assumption is there of having rational actors. Now, economists and people working in finance discovered this is not a very valid assumption. But how do you replace it? And with what do you replace it? And um, what are the, you know, irrationality has a, has a wide range of manifestations, as does rationality, by the way. And how do you, how do you account for this? So I, I just want to, it, it reminds me of one uh, example. I really, I, I don't know enough about, you know, modeling in simulation on financial markets. But one of my colleagues um, in SDS, um, McKenzie, he has studied risk modeling before the financial crisis. And he went uh, to speak with the analysts who were building the risk model. And uh, they told him, you know, we are using this risk model. <clears throat> we know it has flaws. And they were not highly satisfied with the risk model. And, um, you know, he recorded this as part of his research on risk in financial uh, markets and how the risk models were being constructed, etc. And then the financial crisis hit, and then he went back to them and said, you told me before the financial crisis that this model had flaws. So why were you using it? And then <clears throat> they said uh, very clearly, this model is the one that we have been using in the past. It's the one that is most, um, you know, suited. Uh, it's relatively easy to handle. But above all, it allows us to communicate with other people in the same organization who otherwise would not understand what we do. So if you study an organization, <clears throat> you find parts of the organizations who are used to certain ways of dealing with problems. They use models, they use standard procedures, whatever. And in other parts of the organization, something else is being used. But if, in the case of the risk model, it was important that the whole organization used the same model. So they said, this is why we used it. So, you know, again, you have to, to come down of believing the model is the solution to everything and start to look at what happens in, in the context. Who is constructing the model? Um, who is using it? What are the purposes? And 
nobody thought that a risk model is an important way of communicating in an organization. With the benefit of hindsight, you say, ah, I know other examples of this kind, you know. But this is, you know, what <coughs> research is also about, uh, to, to alert you to these uh, things that, that are happening. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it's like the, the, what I said before about uh, the, the research um, methodologies. You know, you have to keep a a critical spirit, um, Robert Merton, who was one of the founders of sociology of science, he spoke of scientific skepticism you know, as being part of the ethos of science. You have to be skeptical. And uh, otherwise, you are not a good scientist. And therefore, I think uh, we, ha we have to learn. It's, it's a new tool. Uh, we have to learn what are the limitations of the tool, what are the new uses of the tool, like asking new kinds of questions, but of course also uh, to do it with an ethos of, of skepticism. We, we have five minutes, so we have one or two questions. Please oh. end that question. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so I guess it's more of an existential question that I have. I'm, I'm trying to find a hope um, in this uh, march towards like 4.0 artificial intelligence. And although there are little glimpses of how technology can help us answer, uh, ask good questions about our past or perhaps our future, but it seems like these little glimpses of a, uh, of a new way of thinking quickly gets shut down before we march to the next uh, predictive uh, project. And it seems like it keeps going that way. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, what is your hope in this in pretty dark times? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's hear the second one also, then uh, yeah, okay. So, um, hi, thank you for the very wonderful presentation. So I feel your presentation is uh, quite philosophical, and I also have a quite philosophical question or concern. So myself, I have an interest in artificial intelligence and also in um, fiction, fiction novels. And I, so um, I always feel um, for, for like human beings, we have a contradictory characteristics in terms of technology and survival. So let's say, um, so when you quoted the um, John von Neumann excerpt, I was not surprised at all. So he was the frontier, but he was the most enthusiastic person to promote technology. And on, on the other hand, he's very concerned about the technology, where it brings us to. And for myself, I'm very interested in the strong artificial intelligence. Like how, because currently I view all the algorithm models, machine learning techniques, I view them as more of a soft artificial intelligence. So I'm quite interested in how making use of other techniques to build into strong artificial intelligence to make robots, computers, really think and be creative as humans. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if it really happens, where, where the world will be like, like what this will bring us to. So I feel this is somehow we have a strong enthusiastic to create something like human beings, but we're not sure if it is causing detrimental or even destroying humankind. So, <laughs> I have, this is like, um, I don't know, this is really a comment or question. Just to sh share my thoughts and hope it to, to, to see what you have in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think both uh, comments or questions <coughs> were <coughs> voice legitimate concerns. I mean, to, to ask the question, where are we going? Where are we heading? It's, it's a very legitimate question. But, <coughs> you know, if you really think the future is open, <coughs> You cannot say it all will end up in catastrophe and uh, so on. Nor can you say everything will be wonderful and we will have no problems. You know, it's a, it's a messy in between somewhere, and uh, it is really up to us. And this is where human agency comes in, where the skepticism of the scientist comes in, to say, um, you know. Are we sure of what we are making, what we are doing? 
uh, we should think also of possible <coughs> uses, misuses. We should communicate with others because it's not the scientists who will decide this is being used or not. It belongs to society. Industry takes up something, it does not take up other things. Governments regulate it in this way or in that way. So there are many other um, you know, stakeholders involved in it. But uh, I think it's the responsibility of scientists if they discover you know, there is a potential misuse or abuse to communicate this. And without <clears throat> saying everything will be bad and it will necessarily happen this way. You have to say it before it actually happens, if possible, or <clears throat> to warn against uh, it becoming uh, more, more widespread. And <clears throat> I think this is um, part of it, um, you know, the future is uncertain, it's inherently uncertain, and we should not recoil from this uncertainty, but uh, embrace it, as I like to say. And if you're not afraid of uncertainty, but if you say, well, you know, there's always room for uh, humans to try to shape it. We don't know what's going to happen. And there are so many examples where people have tried to make predictions how awfully wrong they were in making predictions, where at the time you thought, well, of course, this is going to happen. And because it's, it's the sheer complexity. And <clears throat> working and living with this uh, complexity you know, requires the ability also to, to stand back without saying, well, I'm an optimist or a pessimist, the, the ability and trying to say, you know, I try to follow <clears throat> my scientific ethos and I try to do the best I can. can. So that's all I can tell you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Helga. So